once again. Welcome to the Perceptional, elevating all your senses, expanding your curiosity. So plug in now as we welcome your host, Dr. James Denito. Don't you just like the dramatic turnaround? Hollywood, isn't it? There's always that voice behind the chair, and then the villain is finally revealed to you. Well, we're going to be revealing villains over these podcasts, and uh, you will be armed with the truth. I'm so glad you're back for more. It's episode number three. You're either a glutton for punishment or have a big appetite for this kind of knowledge. And it's just getting started, folks. So today, we are going to talk about climate change. Yeah, this is something where I do know a little bit about, A, my daughter is a meteorologist, and so uh, having been trained at the National Weather Center, we've had some very interesting dialogues, but also I get access to a lot of unique weather data, know what to look for and how to interpret it. Also, uh, I have a big appetite for astronomy and space science. Um, There is access from my website to read a a very comprehensive scientific paper I co-wrote on how black holes might really work. So I've got a lot more mathematical understanding as well of the big picture, the universe, and the fact that our little sun is very responsible for most of our weather. Now, if we want to use all these terms, climate change, global warming, ice age, we have to basically ask ourselves if the planet is going to get warmer versus possibly colder, which one do you want? You don't want it to be colder. You don't want a mini ice age. You don't want an ice age at all. And there's been hundreds of them in the past of all sizes and shapes. We have better hope that if the planet is warming by us, accidentally, intentionally, or by the sun and bigger forces, we better hope that's what's happening. Because the studies have shown if this earth melts out and we end up getting back the greenery of Greenland, we get back the greenery of Antarctica, and so out if the ocean rises, we lose a few cities, what we'll gain when it comes to how much arable land including the tundras and uh, permafrost, the deserts will be re-greenified. We'll have more space and more potential for food and basically health than we've ever had. So we'll have no trouble adapting to a few dozen feet or more of ocean rise if indeed comes. Unfortunately, the instability of nature, because we can say we want to make it more stable, not going to happen. It's always been unstable. Day to day, local to local place, global. Look at just the continents moving. Do you think that's stability where the earth still can't hold its crust in one place? We have to say we're going either hot or cold in a cycle. Which one are we going to? My evidence from everybody I've listened to and some pretty deep scientists do point out the likelihood is much stronger for an ice age of some sort. Let's hope they're wrong, and we'll find out in the next few days. No, I mean the next few years on whether that's going to happen. The news is always ready to tell you tomorrow what's going to actually um, be our our doomsday or not. If we do indeed warm, um, we would have to then question ourselves, how are we possibly doing this? There's no doubt that us humans are making a mess of this planet. We are polluting it. We are destroying many of its ecosystems with 8 billion and growing of us, we have to figure that out because at the very least, it is promoting a certain amount of unsustainability. Some resources may never run out like gas and oil, which I'm also heavily vested into with my, um, let's just say, uh, venture capital. Um, The resources are freshwater perhaps, but the biggest resource is our immune system. And unfortunately, It's not doing so well. Cancer rates are soaring. Fertility is going down. Uh, Cancer rates continue to go up. Obesity. We're a lost race, people. And we had better figure this out soon 
And unfortunately, that's what humans do. We alter the planet in order for us to survive. Uh, nature doesn't need to do that, does it? We look around us, whether it be the smallest bug or the bear, whatever it is, they tend to have just the right amount of balance in their behavior. They use only as much resources as they need. As humans, we want a better life, so we use more resources than we consume in terms of fuel. We use other sources of fuel. We burn it. We turn something into something else for our advantage. That is, that's what's not going to change because we are not Bigfoot. We're not going to be fitting well on this planet without us modifying the environment. But we need to fix things so we don't get so much cancer. So if we get into this climate change, we can also venture into what about them planes in the sky? Chemtrails, we call them. They are possibly calm trails or calm uh, emissions, jet, com jet combustion, short. There's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of planes up in the air. If we are indeed spraying the skies, and we are, I've talked to people who fly those planes or we have organizations that are uh, chasing those jets. Uh, it's a big operation. It's global. They may spray our city. They may spray Washington, D.C. They spray where the rich live, the elites, the power. So don't think you got it all figured out when you see where they're spraying. They are told they're spraying so we're practicing for a bad day when Mother Nature comes down hard on us with a solar flare or an incoming nuke EMP pulse and be able to lay a cloud cover down quickly over key areas to shield the, um, the incoming pulse of energy. That shield has to be made of something which eventually settles down to the earth. And we have evidence that not only is it starting to accumulate in some areas, aluminum is the basis of that, but we also may be noticing it's starting to filter some of the key frequencies of light. We have a global deficiency of vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin. And yet, if you're out in the sun, why are we not seeing enough? I have patients in my clinic all the time. Dark as could be being in the sun, and yet their vitamin D levels are low. So we have suspicion certain frequencies of ultraviolet are being blocked by either what they're spraying or volcanoes or regular pollution. So we do have environmental issues, and we can compensate for now with a $5 a month vitamin. What we need to do, though, is take this um, a little further with some conspiracy. If somebody's trying to change the client, uh, climate, uh, they are either concerned it's getting too cold and actually want to warm it, but that's probably not the case because they tell us it's getting warm already. So they're probably not doing that, although I've seen some interesting conspiracies that the reptilian uh, aliens visiting our planet would prefer a much more desert-like place. Doesn't seem to be going in that direction for them. Sorry, reptilians. On the other hand, if they are spraying skies to cool the planet, and there's strong evidence from the real scientists that this planet may be cooling already, that could be a real catastrophic, stupid mistake. Never know what can go wrong when you're spraying dust in the sky purposely. So we don't know yet who really is orchestrating something of this global nature, but it is real, folks. And climate change, therefore, is being blamed on you. It's your fault. And therefore, no matter how screwed up the weather is, at least you won't be so depressed that you don't have any hope of fixing things. As long as you're to blame, you have some hope that my government, the godlike people that they think they are, will come up with a plan and fix this, even if nature has a bigger uh, thing in store for us here. Let's go with this thing that leads into what I'm describing in terms of what do you think about this climate change? Where's your common sense? The sense that is common to all of us. We all lament it's disappearing. Everybody's got no common sense anymore. What are the senses? Well, they are what we can label, smell, sight, touch, you name it. But as we've seen in my last interview with Professor Nadine, there is no limit to the senses. They're a continuum. And they do overlap. When I get past the basic five, we say the sixth sense is proprioception. Where's gravity? That includes your inner ear, all of these five cumulative up to that point, all the receptors in your joints and your skin, all giving you some perspective as to how to stay upright. 
Because when you start falling, that's another way to die young if you manage to outlive cancer and heart attack. So we need to know where gravity is, and we also need to have a relationship with it so that we can have fun, too, play sports, do all kinds of things. As our senses get further up the list, we end up with the seventh sense, therefore. We call it intuition. I call it the common sense. Uh, if I go to eighth sense, I'm going to call that mental telepathy. So let's stay at seven might be where we call common sense. We all should have it. We should be able to put our heads together, as they say, and come to a consensus. We might say to someone, because we crave to know what's on your mind, what are you thinking? What do you think about that? What were you thinking when you did that stupid thing? Tell me your thoughts, Joe. You know, we have all kinds of ways of craving to know what other thoughts are. And when we are connected, we all kind of shake our head like, yep, that is just logical, isn't it, when you start to see something. So we have a world around us that is doing many illogical things, violating common sense. Where does common sense come from, therefore? Let's do a real simple buildup here of uh, the brain. If you take a biological thing called the cell and you put a bunch of them together, a life form, it is alive and all of those cells and the collective are conscious. They interact with their environment. They even have a certain amount of anticipation. But when you become so complex of an organism, you become self-aware. You look in the mirror and you go, that's me. You recognize yourself at future times. The mirror is an important thing. It's got value in the occult all the way to the simple terms. I'm going to reflect upon these ideas and take a look at yourself, do some introspection, but essentially how we understand who we are is this concept of the mirror, sentience, self-aware. But there's more than that for us humans. We are capable of common sense because we have something else beyond conscious. We have a conscience with an N. That is an ability to judge yourself, especially, and others. How do you judge people? Well, we could put a jury together and we present the evidence and then you come up with something logical, perhaps even driven by emotions. If we judge ourselves um, and we decide we did something wrong, we would feel shame. And when we start to notice people without common sense who do pretty bad things, dumb things, we say, have you no shame? Shame on you for behaving that way. That's a shameless behavior. Shame is a powerful thing. It's a form of judgment. But what are you judging yourself? How do you know what you did wrong? Because inside of you, the sense that is common knows what's right. It's just built in. You should feel bad when you do something wrong. It'll spread through your body physiologically. You throw your friend down on the playground in first grade and they cry. You should feel bad. You should immediately have a sense that says, I did something wrong. Judge yourself. Help them up and say, I'm sorry. And you learn from that. So this common sense is di disappearing for, I have a theory, for lack of faith because if you want to know where it's coming from, how do you have a connection to something that could possibly say this is right and therefore what you do is wrong? That has to be something bigger than you. It has to be a deity, God, something. You don't have to get religious and put beards and men and cloaks and togas. You just have to recognize that You'll never get all the answers. Believe me, the deeper I go into the rabbit hole, every question I get answered, I get two more. It's amazing, not frustrating. It's designed to be that way. I've known many a deep scientist, and I understand that most Nobel Prize winners, the majority, have a faith in something. They're not atheistic. They just want to know how it's done. Answering the why, a little more difficult. So if we are trying to figure out what to do with this apparently faith-given, God-given, deity-driven sense that we know is right, then when we look around us and we start to see all of these zombies without their common sense, then we might also 
ask them, do you have faith in anything? And you're going to find those are the people that don't. Now, the majority of Americans in surveys, 75 percent is still believe in something. And we can break that down how they believe it. Um, but when we start thinking, all right, well, a fourth of them don't, you know what? Most of those people got no common sense. And so we might have to say, unless you people start believing in something, we can't force you. I'm not sure how we're going to get them to start thinking like the herd, start thinking as one, start having this thing that gives us all a sense of confidence that we don't have to anticipate somebody doing something stupid because they don't have any common sense. Now, they can do stupid things. Jump off the high cliff for all I care and your parachute doesn't open. But if you want to do something where other people are possibly going to be in the way, you know, then I'm going to get mad at you. So let's just hope that people begin to come back to faith. And somehow, maybe religion will never bring us back to faith. Maybe the ETs, as we become one with that knowledge, will guide us back as they tell us what they've learned in their search for the ultimate truth. Now, this common sense has a way of allowing us all, as different as we are, to get along. I'll use the metaphor from the song, and maybe there's a real place, Hotel California. The song had won many awards, and it's got some deep stuff in it. Let's think about a hotel that represents the planet, and we'll call the whole thing Hotel California. Everybody is in this one place, this planet, and why are we here? The different reasons. There's the person who comes because it's a great thing. They look forward to a vacation. They check into the hotel. Another person's here on business. They don't really plan on playing. They just got some meeting to do within that hotel. There could be somebody here who had to flee their home, take refuge in the hotel for a while. There could be somebody there doing some dark business in a room. Use your imagination. And um, we might have people there who love the place so much they live in the hotel. We would have them up there in the penthouse, perhaps. But sometimes people live there because they're in servitude and they live in the basement quarters for the servants, much like you might see on a floating hotel called a cruise ship. And let's perhaps even assume a few other reasons people would be there. They all have a different reason for being there, and that might even explain what we see on Earth when we look at our journeys, how unfair things seem to be, whether it's crime, disease, uh, people getting lucky, people getting wealthy, poverty, but we all would be united in the fact that we have this place we're all at together, and it gives us something in common, and that could be another version of how we can find common sense. We can look down to Mother Earth. We're all here together. Let's think alike, or we might see something bigger than us go up in our thoughts to a higher power. What I want to do is get into a, um, a yin and yang a little bit more. This is an endless concept of opposing forces. I may bring it up more than you would imagine. I have an example here. Oh, could almost be a deep thought of the day. Let's talk about this a little bit in a sense of what I just talked about, the force up and the force that holds us on this planet. So the, the thought could be heaven is the sum and hell is the parts. The sum is greater than the parts, but also we could say there's a yang and a yin and a yin and a yang. One is always bigger than the other. One is always more dominant and controlling. And we hope through our spirituality that the good is always in control and winning, but it can't exist without the bad. Darkness, evil. Lightness, brightness, love. Put them opposite each other. The good, the bad, the light, the dark. If we were to go back to holism, the sum is greater than the parts. If hell is the parts and heaven is the sum, then we look at all the things that are around us here that don't look good. It starts to look pretty ugly when you see what us humans are behaving like. 
And that means how we have to survive and how we treat each other. Our survival needs are essentially not pretty. But collectively, the humans seem to be good people, and we feel we're deserving of something more than this. We all want to believe, we feel that we're from something, from something good anyway. So if we want to play this simple metaphor, use this to find the common sense, the Hotel California concept, whatever it takes. Another opposing reaction is one of the things that's part of survival, and that is hormones. We have more than half the hormones in the human body are steroid in nature, made from cholesterol, which, by the way, is made from sugar. Don't anybody tell you it's made from fat. And everybody who reads a physiology book will know this. Eat less fat and eat more carbs so you can make more cholesterol. Makes a lot of sense. Our body makes a lot of cholesterol for a lot of purposes. Hormonally, it's very busy. Uh, the brain is one-fourth or more pure cholesterol. Think about that if you can use those brain cells accurately with the cholesterol surrounding them. So we're going to talk about the hormones of the steroid system. And those hormones are separated into two components. The stress hormones, they are basically flight or fight. Fight means tomorrow is going to be great. We want tomorrow. Therefore, we're going to need muscle. We're going to stand our ground. We're going to reproduce. We'll think about sex. We'll think about families. We'll think about the future. Flight is the stress hormones, the cortisol, all the fear-based things that have us get through today and we'll figure it out tomorrow. So now here's what's interesting. Over here, the number one anabolic hormone, the fight hormone, is testosterone. We hear so much about this with low T. And by the way, that is a big problem. The testosterone levels are plummeting all over the planet, the demasculization of the male human race. Planned or not, let's figure um, that there's probably a mixture of both, stupidity and maybe perhaps a, uh, an agenda, a conspiracy. But testosterone has some interesting phenomenon. When testosterone is up the way it's supposed to be, mortality, death, and morbidity, sickness, go down. When testosterone goes down, however, morality goes up. Yeah. So where's this balance between too much testosterone and not enough? So when we see where a lot of the testosterone still is, even though declining in the younger people, uh, therefore higher, their equation says their morality tends to go down. And that is what's driving the decay of the social structure. So, boy, we're damned if we do, damned if we don't when we get into testosterone. So we have numbers. We don't want the man to ever go below 550, uh, especially once you get past, uh, like me, past 65. Um, and we got to figure out how to do that. And if we have to use a bioidentical cream, we highly suggest that over the five other ways of putting testosterone or even estrogens into the body. And uh, the re reason I like the cream, number six, is the other skin methods, gels and patches, are more expensive and um, more patented, so to speak. When you go inside the body with pellets, uh, oral, or injections, um, these have to be esterified first. They have to be changed a little bit, so they're not really bioidentical anymore. So what we're going to do is say we have to pay attention to testosterone we don't want it too high, and we don't want it too low. And like everything, there's a sweet spot in between. Men, get your testosterone check. A doctor's cost is usually less than $25 to get it run, so don't let anybody charge you $500 for a testosterone test. It's not that expensive to run, probably even cheaper if you have a big volume clinic. And then we have ways of bringing it up. It could be um, the hormone DHEA. It could be the, um, um, the herb like tribulus. So a handful of things in between, but... A lot of things can happen without it being, um, let's say, too synthetic. So what we're going to do today then, if we have enough food for thought here with the concepts of climate change and how we think about it, let's end with the concept of fear. 
Having fears, as a deep thought for today, having fears can protect the reality you want and deserve. Living in fear can become your reality. And with that, good day, America.